bit test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. First you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Global Bicycle Tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley Tour coming up in June and the Mountain Tour in July. The River Valley Tour is in June? I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley Tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K-A-R-L-A. -A. Thank you, Ms Schmidt. Address? Do you need a street address or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box 257, Manchester. Thank you. OK, next. Will you be bringing your own bicycle or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now, we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies or are vegetarian or have to avoid dairy products, things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. All right, I'll make a note of that. Now, the total cost of the tour is $750. That much? The price includes everything. Food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend 5% of the total tour cost. A 5% tip? I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a 30% deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great. I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tyre too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either, since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. 
I have a guidebook of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guidebooks. It would just be extra weight, and the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an interview conducted by an interviewer special with the scientist Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Professor Pite, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa, in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote, there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high-security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. My only thought was, oh, shit. We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We're finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age. But I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name. But the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. Before you listen to their conversation, you have a chance to read questions 21 to 24. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst's report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. I think, um, I think your condition has a lot to do with, um, shall we call it, way of life, habits? Way of life? Habits? Yes, now tell me, Mr. Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes. I smoke, what, about 40, 50 a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But, uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's, it's no good. You see, 50 a day is overdoing it, you must admit. You must cut down at least that. Oh, yes. I know that when you're feeling tense, you, you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course. But, well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down. But, oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort or, 
or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see, well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits. Right. Now you have a chance to read questions twenty-five to thirty. As you listen to more of their conversation, answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast. The usual. A cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two, then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I uh yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch, no first brunch, a cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub, all very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinners around about eight. Uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet, but、uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then well then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner we read or watch TV, but I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend. That you, that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but、uh... eleven says right. Well, that's all right, but lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad, a salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb, granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, doctor. But no. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to hear a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the first part of the lecture and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says tourist information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take 10 pence coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations, payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now, let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 15.30 hours, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Jarabank has 42 Bureau de Change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 o'clock to 17.30 weekdays, 9 o'clock to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 o'clock to 20 o'clock weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 o'clock to 17 o'clock on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use a bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.